Good afternoon to our viewers in Europe and good morning to our viewers in the United States. My name is Steve Sokol and I'm the president of the American Council on Germany. I'd like to welcome you to this edition of Double Exposure. The American Council on Germany and the Goethe Institute are partnering for this series of events that focus on what solidarity means in an environment of increasing polarization. Today's discussion will focus on cohesion and resilience in community and society and features two thought leaders on this issue. To introduce them, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Leonhard Emmerling, who will also moderate the discussion. Leonhard is the director of the Goethe Institute in Chicago and the man behind this series of events focusing on solidarity. Leonhard, it's been great to partner with you and with the Goethe Institute, and I very much look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, it's actually my pleasure working with you. It was a real delight uh, organizing and holding these um, conversations. Um, I would like to welcome today, Dr. Leah Goes uh, and Dr. Clara Vandenberg for the conversation on society and community in what it does it mean in respect to the idea of solidarity. I might briefly introduce our speakers. Dr. Leah Goes is Tupan Chian, uh, Chair in Civil Society and Social Change Postdoctoral Scholar for the 2023-2024 academic year at USC Dornstar, Dornside at the University of Southern California. She completed her PhD in sociology at Harvard University in 2023. Her primary research interests center on the role of community organization as a vital aspect of, a, of the social safety net in how they shape access to resources for individuals, opportunities to build social networks and promote civic engagement and respond to governmental policy and funding influences. Dr. Clara Vandenberg is a researcher at the Center for Civil Society Research at the Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin, which is roughly what is it, the Social Science Center Berlin and Free University of Berlin. Her research focuses on civil society, democracy, and polarization. In November 24, she defended her PhD dissertation, which explored the long term impacts of the 2015 pro-refugee community building and networks in Germany. Congratulations, Clara. Currently, she is part of the Einstein Stiftung Berlin project, Coping with Effective Polarization, where she examines how civil society organizations navigate polarization in public discourse. Thank you very much for being with us today. Um, you both focus in your work on empirical research. Instead of creating lofty theories about how society should look like, how it should operate, you mainly look at what works and what doesn't, what is successful in creating social cohesion and what is not. When do people exercise solidarity and when and why does solidarity lose its momentum? Leah, may I ask you, can you talk a bit about the work you did in Atlanta? Hi, good morning. Um, I just want to say thank you to the Goethe Institute and American Council on Germany. For me, it's a dream as I have taken German since fourth grade and the Goethe Institute is a big part of um, my beginning journey with German. Today, I'm going to be providing some comments on these ideas of solidarity, social cohesion, community. And I'll be focusing in my analyses um, on research I've done in metropolitan Atlanta, which is a large city um, in Georgia. Um, and I did research over six years there, uh, 280 interviews with 96 organizations on the ground from 2018 to 2024. And I'll make some comparisons to research I've done with the Münchner Tafel, which is part of Tafel Deutschland. Um, and I was there in the summer of 2019 to do some comparative work. So I'll provide some commentary on that. But I'm really excited for this conversation today. Um, let me just move this screen. Uh, 
on solidarity, social cohesion, and community, because I believe this is a conversation we really need to have, particularly in these very new, boggling, but slightly repetitive times of discontent and political confusion. And I want to start first with the argument that the solidarity we often talk about in regard to politics or intersectionality is an idea rooted in society. While social cohesion, the closeness and trust I may feel to my neighbors is an idea rooted in community. Solidarity, sociologically, is less studied now than it was a century ago when Durkheim looked to it to understand trends in suicide, for example. We take the idea a bit for granted. We all know that solidarity is about connecting across some bigger, broader ideas, often an issue like women's rights or multiracial coalitions. But solidarity does, most often, play out when disparate groups vote as a block or raise concern together in protest. You can probably think of some of your own examples. But solidarity is not social cohesion. Social cohesion is a well-studied phenomenon regarding how people generally in close proximity trust one another and utilize those ties. We primarily do this with geographical boundaries, who lives nearby, or temporal ones, who's been around me the longest. The longer this proximity exists, the greater potential for social cohesion. I would argue that the most recent American election cycle occurred in a period where many voters could feel strong solidarity with like-minded individuals, but are simultaneously experiencing low social cohesion, feeling disconnected from their real life neighbors. Loneliness is in fact at an all time high. I think this is in part of what also explains much of the democratic voter shock around how can my neighbors vote for Trump because they do not actually know who their neighbors are. I will also say that the internet at social and social media may be creating less social cohesion while fostering opportunities for cross-group solidarity. And someone, not me, should be doing more research on that. In sociological terms, when I say solidarity, I'm referring to how people can connect across social divides, big social divides. But beyond that, I think the bigger questions we are getting at here today is, how can our societies weather social breakdown and distrust? Really, how can we build a resilient social fabric? Where can we connect efforts that foster solidarity and social cohesion, both in, a, both in service to a stronger social fabric? And I present the idea that individuals can make sense of broader societal issues that can foster or inhibit solidarity in their everyday lives, able to perceive their fellow citizens as neighbors and their neighbors as part of, a, as part of this bigger social fabric. In this way, solidarity can happen at the community level through interaction, participation, and learning. You can learn to be in solidarity at the community level while simultaneously fostering social cohesion. So what am I talking about? The quick answer is we should all be volunteering more. How does this work? I'm currently writing a book about charitable food programs in the United States. And these organizations give out food to people free of charge or for a very small fee. It's very similar to Tafel Deutschland in Germany, though there are some programmatic differences and the participation numbers in the United States are about eightfold larger. And in my book, I argue that our social fabric is made strong through both social cohesion and solidarity, and that charitable food programs like food pantries, where people can go and pick up this free food often these organizations are run by volunteers, but those types of organizations help to strengthen our social fabric because they encourage social cohesion and solidarity through a process I call narrative weaving. Narrative weaving is an organizationally embedded process through which individuals can connect social ideas to community serving and community oriented activities. For example, broad ideas around inequality, the haves and the have nots, can be connected to how you might package Brussels sprouts or put carrots lovingly in a bag or talk to folks who visit the food pantry. All of a sudden, you become more aware of the social policies that shape who might be coming in the doors of those food pantries. It is not just the act of volunteering that helps me understand how federal policy shapes charitable food need, for example, but it's the conversations and the participatory engagement inclusive in this act. It is not merely the volunteering, it is the connection of understanding ideas that shape solidarity 
and shape my understanding of who's in the in-group or out-group that help, pro um, help create this process of narrative weaving. And how a food pantry expects you to treat aid seekers may change how you see people who are seeking aid and see them as an important part of both your community and your society. What I mean by this is that participating in charitable food programs can also alter how you vote, how you engage with your neighbors, and how you therefore build social cohesion and solidarity in community and society. You may vote for broader social policies that support poor families, and you may greet people with more patience and kindness at the bus stop, for example. Narrative weaving helps connect social cohesion and solidarity without sacrificing one for the other, because this concept connects the stories, schemas, and frames we use to understand our social world from the broader society to the streets of our neighborhood. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Leah. I'm sure we'll come back to some details of your presentation and and your and your uh, talk. But um, maybe let me turn to Clara for the moment. Uh, Clara, in the last years, you followed the ebb and flow of solidarity, especially in Germany, after the so-called migration crisis in 2015. There was a massive surge in lift and practice solidarity towards people who tried to seek asylum in Germany, triggered also by Angela Merkel's affirmation, we can do it, wir schaffen das. But over the course of time, solidarity faded away, if I'm not mistaken. Can you talk a bit about what happened and whether there's a certain pattern, these movements of searching solidarity, fading solidarity? whether there's a pattern these movements seem to follow. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for the invitation and the introduction. Thank you also, Leah, for, um, for this really fascinating input. Um, I hope we can kind of connect these thoughts later. So my input is a little bit more, um, I guess, empirical. I'm going to talk about my empirical research, starting with the rece refugee reception crisis of 2015-16. Um, which you, of course, probably all remember uh, when over, I think, one million uh, people um, came to Germany in 2015-16 uh, in that year alone. And we saw an incredible amount, an unparalleled amount of, of support. A um, um, lot of, a lot of, lots of people, um, lots of volunteers who had never really worked in migration before, who had never really worked or had any contacts with refugees before deciding to kind of welcome uh, refugees at the train stations, going to the local refugee shelter to see what, um, what's needed. And this was kind of uh, really unprecedented and uh, I think a really interesting starting point to study uh, solidarity. And I will talk a little, bit, a little bit about this time and then what kind of sparked solidarity um, why it decreased and also how solidarity can um, can also help to uh, establish long-term communities and help community building. Um, so as I said in 2015-16 many people helped. I, I think that around one-third of Germans supported refugees by making donations and other um, other support, providing other support. Five million people supported refugees on the ground um, with, um, with uh, giving, providing German classes, providing uh, childcare, um, everything you could think of as uh, emergency support. Um, also food, clothing, etc. And then um, we know that 15,000 new projects and initiatives were created all across the country in that year alone, which um, yeah was pretty uh, surprising, I think, for everyone. Um, so, and I already said that this uh, refugee support had many faces. So you had um, you had German people providing German classes. You also had, of course, people protesting on the streets and demonstrations. But most of the support was really provided um, within and around refugee shelters and um, family support centers and so on. So what sparked this uh, wave of solidarity with that, which we haven't really seen um, in, um, in Germany after World War II? 
um, there was definitely first a humanitarian need. So there was a visible suffering of refugees. People could see refugees arriving in their city's train stations. The media coverage was, of course, super high. Um, but the mobilization was also driven by Christian values, people who um, by humanitarian values, um, and there were a lot of middle class people. Um, so not your typical activists you could maybe find on at uh, demonstrations, but really the kind of ordinary, uh, ordinary people, as I said. And there was a spirit of optimism during that time. And I think Leonard already mentioned that Angela Merkel's statement, "Wir schaffen das, we can do it," really inspired a lot of confidence in action. So people, I think, wanted to be part of this hopeful project. Um, and the more people kind of came and, and supported refugees, the more uh, other people kind of felt inspired. Um, and this was, um, um, yeah, uh, really, really interesting. Um, there was also a little bit of polit political activism, but the most, most, uh, most part of this civic engagement was this um, typical, yeah, this classic volunteering, what Leah already described. Um, the political aspect definitely changed. So many uh, volunteers and refugee support groups that were founded during that time developed a political motivation later when they were kind of a f um, when they saw that um, refugees couldn't really get work permits when the situation became much more difficult. Also politically, then these uh, these types of groups also became more politically aware and started actions. But at first, it was, it was this type of volunteering. Um, we, but then, as Leonard also said, this solidarity and the activities around refugee support um, really declined in 2016-17. This is, first of all, very typical, and uh, the social movement research has a lot of examples for these waves of mobilization and demobilization. So this is a classic pattern um, of initial enthusiasm followed by a decline over months. I think this is very classic and... Um, this is not only the case here, but you could also see other mobilizations. Um, the Women's March movement in the US that kind of declined over after a while, but also um, support, emergency support after Hurricane Katrina in the US, but also these types of disasters in, um, in Germany. But uh, another reason was the shift from emergency support to integration. Um, so there was a decline in refugee arrivals and that also reduced the emergency needs. So there was le less, less of an emergent need, um, less of an um, acute need. Of course, there was a huge need still for, for refugees to get support, but it was just not as visible. Um, and um, so the focus in this, in this work started, um, shifted to long-term integration. And this is always much harder to sustain I mean, to sustain, to sustain movements, to sustain this type of action is always very, very difficult. And, and there were also overwhelming challenges that came, uh, that were, were very apparent in refugee support. So volunteers really struggled with the complex and long-term tasks of providing and taking care of um, refugees who had, um, who had trauma from, 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 their, um, from their experiences, who had many legal barriers. And so this resulted in burnout and frustration, not only on the side of the refugees, but also on the side of the volunteers who kind of, who couldn't keep this work up. Um, and many of them kind of returned to their normal lives and went to their job, back, back to their jobs. And a few of course stayed. Uh, and some of this is still going on today. Um, and lastly, there was a changing public sentiment, as you know, I mean, there's a growing negative attitudes towards refugees in Germany. Now it's very, very apparent. Um, but even in 2017, you could already notice that um, there was emergence of the uh, right wing actors, um, like a social movement actors, but also the alternative for Germany, this right wing party um, or far right party, um, extremist party that kind of started to influence the political landscape, which also, I think, um, reduced the, the solidarity um, uh, in Germany. And then finally, um, I would like to, to mention, because I, I did this, I did a lot of research in, in four mid-sized cities in Germany, um, where I completed a lot of interviews um, and kind of followed the activities for a while. 
Um, and I noticed that re despite reduced mobilization and despite this kind of lasting, I, I, I am um, pro-refugee communities were formed in these in specific regions. Um, and these pro-refugee communities, as I call them, you could call them, I call them also local civic action communities, but they are similar to social movement communities. They are characterized by sustained interaction among volunteers and activists, but also associations, welfare organizations, church congregations, and so on. So in some cities, I found these communities that really survived over time. And my question was kind of, why? <laughs> why, um, why, why do some communities survive and some not? And there are different regions. But I really noticed that solidarity, first of all, in these types of instances, and this may be a different type of solidarity or a different, um, I, I take a different lens um, than, um, or perspective than Leah. Uh, solidarity is born, born out of immediate crisis here in this case and can evolve under certain conditions um, into long-term community structures and maybe long-term solidarity. But this like, wave or spark of solidarity um, is here born of immediate crisis, or I guess in, 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 it doesn't have to be a crisis, but a need or something that is uh, kind of uh, can spark this solidarity. And then community building, as I studied it, um, can um, can kind of develop out of this solidarity through shared experiences, and so it can be de can de be developed through collective experiences and mutual support. It can be developed through facing and overcoming adversities together, um, which I think tightened these communities that I um, that I observed, and then continuous continuous collaboration, continuous interaction and an emotional connection is, uh, is super important to kind of keep this community up, community building up, or you could also say this solidarity up. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is it for me for now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Clara. This is um, very fascinating and, and there are a lot of questions I have about this, but you both mentioned the relevance of, of volunteering, and I would love to come back to that. But may I ask Clea first about something I find found in her uh, in her in her thoughts about the question of solidarity. You you mentioned that you speak about solidarity on a micro and on a macro level. And it's, if I understand you correctly, you connect social cohesion to community level and solidarity to society level. Can you revisit that idea a little bit and elaborate on that? Yeah, Thank you. So, happily to do so. I think of it kind of, I love a diagram. This idea that at the society level, we have this broader way of understanding and really seeing where solidarity plays out over time. So I think when I think about what Clara has shared, Solidarity in this way is something you can see over many decades, over many years to this, this bigger coalition base, perhaps over time. We can think about um, examples that would be really good around solidarity or how like Democrats and Republicans in the Senate always vote on farm bills or how people in community in the United States may, you know, there's these interracial coalitions, right? Black and Hispanic Latinx voters voting in conjunction on certain issues, though, of course, this past election has presented some, some faltering in that. And that at the community level, which is, you know, underneath society, that's where social cohesion plays out. And I separate those because I spent six years in almost 100 organizations in Metro Atlanta, talking to people who were engaged in work of feeding their neighbors. In the United States, you know, one in nine to one in 11 people are food insecure. Um, and these organizations, of which there are almost 60,000 in across the United States, serve about one in six people in the U.S. One in six people go to a charitable food organization, like a food pantry, every year. Um, probably closer to one in seven when there's not a financial crisis or a pandemic. And in Germany, in Tafel Deutschland, you know, there's only a thousand Tafels. There's only a thousand of them. So in comparison to the size of these organizations and their reach, the reason why I mention this 
like the size and the 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 reach of these organizations is because at the community level when we talk about social cohesion it became clear that these places these food pantries these soup kitchens really were places where people got to know their neighbors at the same time they were places where people were beginning to understand ideas that were bigger than just the food pantry just their proximate neighbors all of a sudden they were making sense of poverty policy of food policy um, why it mattered that their bus stops didn't have any um, overhangs for shade. And then they all of a sudden were organizing in their city to put shade covers over their bus stops so people who came to their food pantry would be shaded. And in my mind, I see that as a movement from social cohesion to being in solidarity because those efforts play out at a broader societal level. They impact people beyond the community because the laws change. I bring this all into this comparison because I think so much of when we think about volunteerism only happens at this community level. But my hope is if we understand that volunteering creates these participatory engagements, we can see how solidarity can actually be taught at the community level and how that engagement can actually shift patterns in solidarity and how people are functioning. That's that micro level engagement of solidarity. That's how it gets woven in at the community level. And this is also what you refer to with narrative leading, that it's that there, these low, uh, community micro level social cohesion practices kind of build up to to a uh, to solidarity on a on a on a on the macro level, uh, which is then society. Do, do, that, do I understand? Yeah. That? And it happens. It happens for individuals. So this is an individual level phenomenon in the sense that. It's a process I can experience. So for example, um, I went with my mother to a food pantry in our where I grew up in Atlanta, and my mother didn't know that in the United States, um, what we have is called SNAP, food stamps. We give people monetary assistance to buy food in a grocery store, but about one third of people who say they are food insecure, who are hungry, do not qualify because they are not poor enough. That's like 13 million people. And so when we were at the food pantry, my mother learned this fact. This is something that became aware to her. She was engaging with people who were coming in and with the other volunteers. And as we go home, my mother comments to me, how is it that there are people who are hungry who can't get that help? That's wrong. And I was like, well, will that change how you vote? And she's like, it will certainly make it clear to me that if someone doesn't put that on their platform, I don't want to vote for them. And so it's this idea that that individual engagement and narrative weaving, all of a sudden she's putting together this story and her volunteer work to understand broader policy. That's at the individual level. And then if you see this happen over time, as I did in organizations, you can see whole food pantries change their entire functioning to better um, work on equity. So helping people who come in volunteer, sharing in civic engagement. So then it can play out at a broader community level as well. So you can see this phenomenon for individuals and for whole communities, whether that's geographical or a demographic based um, understanding of community. It's a beautiful and very positive picture <laughs> you're, you're drawing here and it's, it's, it's fantastic. But uh, may I come back to, to, to Clara then because you, you, Leah, you, 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 you describe a, a build-up of a movement, while Clara somehow described the kind of being tired or getting tired of that movement, and that's kind of that would be my question about uh, where, where you both speak about volunteering and and um, so my question would then come in to both of you, but maybe Clara first. I mean, volunteers get some get some tired at some point. They they can't do it all the time because they have a normal uh, well, normal life. They have a life to live. They have to earn some money. They have they 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 have their jobs and and, and things like that. So my question would be, Leah, while you build a, while you paint a positive picture, Clara paints more uh, a kind of not sad but a but a different picture. So. To, to so what do you think about the idea that 
that volunteering then needs to lead to institutions where, where, where that idea that is apparently alive within lots of people and then lots of people feel empathy and and um, towards their next kin or towards their neighbor and towards the ones who are, who are in need. But doesn't that need to be built into institutions so that can be sustained beyond the, the engagement of the individuals? Maybe Clara, for, what do you think? Yeah, um, if you mean, do you mean institutions like um, uh, having, uh, getting uh, paid for volunteering or maybe make it, um, um, make it part of, I mean, I think that talks, they have been ideas, I guess, and not policies, but ideas in Germany um, to create um, time away from the job that is still maybe five hours a month where you get still paid and you can do volunteering or something like this. Um, I don't know if you if you think about institutions like this, but um, for, for sure volunteer, volunteering um, in the long term is very difficult. I think there are also phases in life. I, I think we see that people around 30, 40 who, have, who start families, who have kids, jobs, tend to volunteer, at least in Germany, a little bit less. Um, and then, uh, then when people get older, they have time again, they, they are in retirement and then they, they kind of increase, uh, volunteering increases in that, uh, in that generation. Um, but um, I think that uh, there are certainly um, ways to kind of make it easier for people to, to, um, to spend time volunteering if they want to, because many people actually do. Um, I think there's definitely a, a shift from volunteering in these tra traditional volunteering in these associations, um, these type of Vereine in German associations where you have a clear membership and you pay your little fee every year and you have your a yearly meeting and then you have a president, everything. This is very traditional volunteering and I think we see less of this so people are less interested in being involved in these kind of firm, in these structures but more more and more people um, want to in, be involved in projects they want to be more flexible maybe they want to volunteer for six months a year and then they want to kind of change a project do something else maybe stop volunteering and then get on and I think we um, organizations and civil society, also the established organizations have to kind of um, find ways to make that possible because they, uh, many of these organizations are still hoping that once they have, once they have a volunteer, they can just, um, it's stay safe, they will come, they will do their job, but this is uh, just, I think, a very different time from uh, 20, 30 years ago where that um, kind of connection, maybe also this identity or this um, people identifying with an association is just, I think, less uh, clear. Yeah, then no, no, I really like that question. And when Clara was talking, um, I wrote down infrastructure because it's, I think it's a part of this story. How can Clara and I have these different understandings of what volunteerism kind of ends up in? you know, like down the road two years. And I think that the story for us is different because Clara is talking about a phenomenon that took place over the course of three years. And I was in food pantries that were founded in 1975 mm -hmm. and still exist, which one asks, you know, begs the question of like, well, what problem are they solving if they still exist 50 years later? And I think the difference in this question is food pantries and charitable food in the United States is a major part of our, our social safety net infrastructure because many of them are nonprofits who receive tax benefits for existing. And we pump billions of federal dollars into these food pantries by the through the purchase of food through federal programs. So they're very well established. Um, and they even in the sense of crisis, so if we look to the pandemic, when food need skyrocketed across the US, it wasn't new organizations that were forming to meet this need. It was existing organizations expanding their reach. So for example, let's say a church has a food pantry. And in the US, we don't have like Kirchensteuer. So people don't pay a tax to belong to a church. They would pay um, 
like their tithes to the church, however they want, if they want to. A church has a food pantry, which in the U.S. is very legal and in nonprofit um, law. They can put out federally funded food. It's all good and easy to do. So instead of saying multiple churches in the community started their pan own pantries during the pandemic, these churches already had the infrastructure. And all they did was open one more day a week or put out, you know, twice as much food when they were open. And that's another piece of this. I'm really curious, Clara, if you found this. With food pantries and charitable food in the U.S., these organizations aren't open all the time. So it's not like a nine to five. It's not like people are giving up their jobs. They might volunteer for three hours on a Thursday night because that's the only time they're open. Um, and many food pantries in my sample actually operated on what someone referred to as retirement hours. So um, this idea that because so many volunteers are retired, that they only operate between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. because it's the least amount of traffic for people on the road, right? So it's not as intensive. And the need, while it's acute for some people who are experiencing it, the hunger needs in the U.S. are chronic. We've never had less than 9% of food insecurity ever. So people are always going to be in need of food. Um, I remember actually at, when I was at the Munchna Tafel, um, someone was mentioning like, you know, this importance of volunteering. He was talking about being a Ruhestand, you know, being retired. He's like, I'm not standing quietly. Like this, you know, I'm retired, but I'm engaged. And I think that's part of the story is like, you've got people who want to be involved, but it's not all the time. You know, it's once a week. It, I think it really matters to the sense of crisis, to what Clara is talking about. I'd be curious to know more. This this crisis piece, I think, plays a huge role in burnout and lasting infrastructure questions. Maybe I can um, just contribute a few more thoughts because I think it's super interesting. Um, I just wanted to uh, say that, of course, I'm. I mean, I, I've looked. I've looked at these decrease and decline of volunteering. But I also um, found these great communities that kind of um, stayed alive and that organizations and also these volunteer groups kind of um, survived and, and um, remained super active. And I think one contributing factor for sure was the, was the, the, the friendships, the interactions, the, 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 everything that a volunteer could get out of um, their activities that's not... Um, monetary of course but the emotional connections the being part of this uh, of this group and they are excited to see each other at events at film screenings they do a lot of they do summer parties these these types of um, personal connections are super important to keep volunteering um volunteering up because um yeah burnout is just <laughs> it's just very typical for for these types of activities um but um um I think pe many people, as I think Leah said at the beginning, um, um, create, can create social cohesion at the local level and then they know each other and then they want to kind of keep meeting uh, one another. Um, but this is, I think, um, easier in, in projects and initiatives uh, where um, people can really engage and not be get a, get a specific job and you know, but be engaged and kind of can also decide things and be a very active contributor instead of, um, I don't know, standing somewhere and building building something once once a month and then it's done. Um, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but being like really this type of engagement and interaction is very, very important. Yeah, right. like it's not transactional, like that participation and interpersonal engagement is key. Because if it's just about a service or a resource, I don't think those relationships form. Um, may I just interject here a question from the from the chat? Because we're talking about volunteering, and there's a pertinent question: What role does volunteer work play in the German healthcare system? The question to Clara, and then I would love to come back briefly to the question of institution. Maybe Clara, you want to respond? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I think um, uh, if you think of healthcare uh, in a broader sense, not only in the hospital, but providing care in hospices and um, um, and other types of 
men, I don't know, medical care centers and so on. I think there are a lot of volunteers in the sector, this healthcare sector, there are a lot of volunteers. Um, I think there are many institutions and many nonprofits are really dependent on, uh, on, on volunteers. And I remember when, uh, when we, before, I think, was it like 10, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we had this, uh, um, you probably also know this, this um, uh, um, um, military service, or you could also choose this, um, this um, volunteer year. I also did this volunteer year, even though I didn't have to do it, but many men especially chose this volunteer year to get out of the military service. Um, and after after that that stop, this kind of um, mandatory service, a lot of um, medical in the a lot of clinics and so on were really um, had really had a really difficult time to provide the care they had provided before because all these people, uh, these young people who who supported the clinics were missing. Uh, so this was kind of difficult. So that kind of goes to show how important volunteering is in this sector. Thank you very much, Clara, for, for the clarification. Um, maybe I'll come back briefly to that question of institutions. Um, maybe I'm obsessed with that question, but maybe it's still interesting. I mean, institution, I mean more like, okay, that we that there would be tax incentives to, to companies to, I mean, uh, going back to the refugee crisis, uh, to employ refugees uh, or even you can say um, companies have to have a quota uh, that they have to employ um, refugees to a, in a certain to a certain percentage, uh, like we have it with um, Germany has it sometimes with disabled people, or they have a quota on how many women have to be on board of a of a company, and so that there is a, a legal legal infrastructure and or it's legally institutional juridically institutional institutionalized to exercise that solidarity beyond uh, the scope of empathy or beyond um my my community this is what i meant with institution I, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it's it's seen at this side of the atlantic differently than it's seen on this side of the Atlantic. <laughs> so maybe who wants to go first, Leah? Okay. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that since we had engaged in having uh, this talk because in the US there, I mean, when we think about some of the, the political context, or I, you know, if we look at the, how the Ampel Coalition, like Germany's got its own thing going on right now. Absolutely. Yeah. But, in the U.S., where we have this like this election pointed out one which we've already known this major social divide about who votes Democratic, who votes Republican, and then all of a sudden this election happens and people are voting in ways no one thought, and it's this idea that we don't know each other, and I think that conversation is actually kind of overriding, or rather, it's much louder than some of the conversations we should have on like what solidarity really looks like in the U.S. And I think when we talk about this institutionalized bit, it's hard for so solidarity to be institutionalized in the U.S. the way we might see it in Germany, because we don't have coalitions. We have a two party system. So when we talk about solidarity playing out in our institutions, it's more like I can think of some of the examples in the comments, like when organizations form, when you've got hospitals working with nonprofits, working with schools where communities, you know, counties or uh, a large area that covers millions of people are starting to provide services or act in a way that is promoting some type of community um, supportive ideal. Because when we talk about solidarity at the truly federal level, it, it just doesn't work the same way because we're not going to have three parties that come together because we don't have three parties that could come together. That's just not how our system works. But solidarity can happen in the way some groups vote on certain um, down ballot, say for instance, like um, initiatives around housing or houselessness, initiatives on clean water, emissions, that kind of thing. Um, it's 
I think the biggest difference too between Germany and the US when it comes to how we can understand and experience solidarity is back to this idea about what volunteerism can look like. And I think simply that volunteerism is an older and more institutionalized concept in the US than in Germany solely because, I mean, we can look to de Tocqueville who came to the US in the 1800s just because he was like, what's going on here? Everyone's involved, everyone's engaged. And today we have entire systems in our federal and state governments dedicated to supporting those organizations in ways that just don't really exist in Germany. Um, I think the perfect example actually is comparing our charitable food to like Tafel Deutschland. Tafel Deutschland receives absolutely no government funding. And in the U.S., food pantries, soup kitchens, those types of organizations, it's estimated receive around like $50 billion worth of support, whether that's monetary or in the value of food. So they're just very different institutional spaces for sure. Yeah, it's definitely. I mean, in Germany, you have they don't get maybe don't get state funding, but then people get um, kind of a social security and they hopefully, obviously not all can uh, kind of buy can buy groceries. They can't uh, not, because I mean we have these tafel and these tafels and they do, they they are definitely needed. So there's definitely kind of a a, um, a need that's not met by the state for sure. When I think about these institutions uh, and tax incentives, I think so. First of all, a lot of companies. Um, were excited um, in Germany. I don't know how many, I don't know the numbers, but I remember I also interviewed a couple of companies and businesses and they were excited and ready to um, kind of uh, get um, get um, refugees and, and integrate them into their um, companies. And, um, as, and, and also there's a competitiveness. Uh, a lot of companies need workers, skilled workers, unskilled workers. Um, and um, I think, I mean, I think there's, I'm sure there was also a, a solidarity, but there's also, I mean, these companies need workers and there's a short shortage of workers. And I think this is kind of the main reason. And I think tax incentives could have been, uh, and it could have been uh, um, realized, I think, uh, in 2015, when the situation and the sentiment was towards refugees was different. But I think today, we're at such a different um, time regarding immigration. And I think, um, I mean, these uh, the companies are pre pretty open to migration. But since many people, voters are kind of increasingly anti-migration, it's very, very difficult. And this tax incentives, I don't think, would be, <laughs> would be realistic at the moment. Um, um, but uh, in terms of, I mean, because you asked uh, before, Leon Leonard, you asked um, when we talked before, you, you thought about this kind of, could we also see a, a mandatory volunteer year or something like mandatory volunteering in Germany? Um, uh, and I think this is also a little bit difficult to reintroduce after it's kind of gone. <laughs> it's very difficult to reintroduce. Even It's also very difficult to int introduce this um, military service again, this military mil military service. I think many people, I don't know, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think there's this type of um, vast um, solidarity uh, at the macro level where a lot of, where um, kind of you would find a majority for this volunteer, the mandatory volunteer year. And I'm, I'm not even sure this is kind of um, useful anymore. I think it's much more useful to support local civil society organizations, small initiatives, give them funding, give them space where they can meet. I mean, there's a lot of, there, we have a lot of cuts, funding cuts uh, at the civil society level at the moment in Germany. Um, I think there will be kind of, uh, um, we, we will see them in 2025 and we'll see the consequences, but it's, I think it's much more useful to give, uh, give, give money to organizations to kind of keep their work up instead of um, kind of um, 
supporting this uh, mandatory volunteer year. I also don't think it's the time for it. I don't think we have that level of social cohesion at the macro level um, that people would be very fond of it. Um, that's just my my guess, yeah. Um, thank you very much to both of you. Um, we have roughly 10 minutes left. And um, maybe um, we started with uh, with your experience on the ground, you, Leah, working with food pantries, and you, Clara, looking at the support of the uh, for the for migrants, that search of uh, solidarity with with foreigners or with strangers, and um, so maybe I I if I'm allowed, then I um, may move to to another question, which is a little bit more theoretical, but it, it's actually. Uh, Kind of comes from a from a reading I'm I'm I, I did. It's a book by Leah Hunt Hendricks and Astra Taylor. Uh, Solidarity: The Past, Present, Future of a World Changing Idea. And they, I was totally surprised that they argue against charity organizations uh, in the U.S. for for several reasons. And um, their argument actually is in, in at the end the argument that uh, charity and the kind of the exercise of solidarity via charity cements inequality. Well, I mean, we, we, we probably will never get rid of uh, inequity and end, uh, but uh, they also read charity and innovate charity uh, solidarity via charity as a tool to maintain inequality in a society. And um, I find that uh, I was kind of puzzled by it. And uh, I wonder whether what you think about the relationship between solidarity and equality in a society. Would solidarity maybe not the basis of uh, equal, uh, of, 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 of a society, but maybe solidarity would be a tool to achieve equality in society. Does that make clear you, you, you not? Maybe you go first. <laughs> I teach a class on non-governmental organizations and social change, and this question of is charity bad comes up for about two, three weeks, where my students just are boggled by the idea of like, are the systems that we have in place actually continuing to exacerbate the problems? And I think the, the way you're phrasing this question, Menard, is like, in a, in a way, the, the problem I think that's at hand is if we can have solidarity in an unequal world. Because solidarity is just when two groups have joined to, you know, or however many groups have come together on an issue, or, you know, we can more broadly think of it that, you know, they've come together in the government or patriotism, but we could pick a smaller issue, like say for instance, we care about safe parks. That's still an act of solidarity. And so solidarity can exist in a place and in a society where things and people are unequal, where we have major class differences, major race differences, and those turn out with like disparate results for health or life expectancy, however you measure it. So for me, when we talk about the role of charity, I don't actually really think that every organization should be viewed as being a charity organization as like, oh, us with the haves are giving to the have nots. I think of it more as like a, a way to differentiate between things that are given away free of cost or are like nonprofits. So rather their tax structure. Um, I think having nonprofit organizations is very useful to allow communities to establish organizations that anyone can join. But in this space, the biggest thing for me when we think about what solidarity can be and the goals to reduce inequality is centering dignity. Because we live in an unequal world now, getting rid of like nonprofits and charity, I think would kind of, I actually can't imagine that. I would love someone to, to explain to me what it would look like if we just, with the snap of our fingers, got rid of every nonprofit in the US. But the thing is, is I think how we make charitable organizations, nonprofit organizations really serve the betterment of society 
isn't by getting rid of them, it's by centering dignity in what they do. And by this, I mean, making it so people who have less voice, who have, you know, a reduced ability to have an opinion, have less money to donate, still are equitably a part of the decision-making process. And I think this is why I'm so optimistic about charitable food orgs, about food pantries, is because I saw this happening. I saw food pantries that their aid seekers were the volunteers. Everyone was involved in the giving back process. And that made things very different in those spaces because people felt like they were not just takers, but they were givers and creators and they were true neighbors and that it was the give and take. And so I'm, I'm optimistic because I've seen it. I don't think it's going to work everywhere. But these questions we have around, can we make our society more just or better, I think really have to first be like, how are we centering dignity and who's at the, you know, in the conversation? Because even if we bring those people in conversation, there's still massive need. So we still have to meet it. You know, it's like chicken egg cycle. So my thought is let's bring dignity front and center and then see where we are in a decade. Cause you know, bureaucracy moves slowly. So here we are. Yeah, that's a really um, fascinating question. Um, I've also been thinking about this a lot. I, I think there is um, solidarity at the state level, uh, at least from, uh, this is, I mean, a very German perspective, but I think there needs to be so this type of solidarity at the state level where the state, pro um, we pay, everyone pays taxes, everyone pays, I mean, the, some pay more, some pay less, but everyone pays taxes and there's a, to provide, a, to kind of um, fund the social system where everyone can live in dignity, which is, um, I don't think is the, the case in Germany anymore. I think many people live underneath the um, um, poverty line, so um, it, it clearly doesn't work, <laughs> but it's still very, very important to keep the system up, I think. And I think, but part of this or um, in addition to the state, I think there is also another solidarity that comes from from civil society, from everyone who can contribute. And, and there, I'm, I completely agree with Leah that um, there needs to be solidarity at this local level where people feel a common humanity and feel connected to each other. And there's, I mean, there are strikes, there are unionization. There's um, solidarity with migrants. So there's, I mean, there's solidarity with the in-group kind of, or with workers. You can kind of kind of create this commonality. You can create, um, but you can, as, as my example also shows, create solidarity with people that are actually at the out-group, I guess, or are not, are not part of my inner circle and are very diff different to, to, to me. Um, and that I, I guess this is a type of maybe the dignity or the humanity uh, and this type of we are all we are humans and uh, we have basic needs and these people are in uh, in danger and they are in need and so we can kind of provide but this is I think the more, more difficult I guess uh, solidarity to sustain maybe uh, because it's um, I mean the volunteers who work who support refugees still and I looked at this time for a frame from like 2015 to 2020 2021 um, the politics changed and um, and neighbors are critical of volunteers uh, and, and they get a lot of criticism why are you still working why are you still supporting these people they should be they should manage on their own now and so on so it's much more difficult to navigate, but I think um, I think there are still many people who are uh, who are um, on it, and there I think institutions in, in terms of um, um, uh, the state kind of supporting civil society with money and with resources is just very important to keep these um, uh, these um, organizations and initiatives up and in, for the long term because yeah. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. Uh, I think uh, that was a beautiful iteration of double exposure. And thank you very much, Clara. Thank you very much, Leah. I thought it was really interesting and a lot of food for thoughts. Thanks also to Steve and Emma from the American Council on Germany. Uh, the podcast will be up, I guess, on our websites in a few days. And um, there will be one last iteration of double exposure 
uh, with uh, Leora Ausländer and Miriam Wenzel uh, from the Miriam Wenzel from the Jewish Museum in Frankfurt. Leora Ausländer is a, a scholar here from the University of Ch uh, Chicago. Thank you again, and um, talk soon. Thank you. Bye.